Hello, and welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Cover 2 Podcast. I'm Jared Smith. I'm Nick Nina. And we've got a big show for you guys today. We were going to start with a uh, recap of this past week's NFL games, but last night there was breaking news out of Major League Baseball. Yes. Garrett Cole, the prized top pitching free agent in this class, chose to, uh, l- well, not leave California, but not come home back to California, he chose to go to the New York Yankees in a blockbuster mega deal. He now is the highest paid pitcher in Major League Baseball history. So of course, uh, Nick has his his Dodgers head on. Yeah. A little disappointed, myself being an Angels fan, a little disappointed there, but we have to start with that breaking news today. Uh, And then a little later on in the show, we will get into uh, this past week's NFL games And uh, as the playoff picture becomes a little more clear, what this means for some teams who are on the bubble, um, potentially looking to get in. But Nick, we got to start with Garrett Cole. We have Uh, to. All along this offseason, we knew that more than likely he would not be returning to the Houston Astros. And because he is from Newport Beach, went to Orange Lutheran, went to UCLA, it was almost presumed that the, the Angels and the Dodgers would have the upper hand in signing the prize for agent. And he kind of, you know, took a 180 and chose to go to the East Coast. Yeah. The New York Yankees, who were, you know, one of the most relevant teams in Major League Baseball. And they basically busted out their checkbook and said, here's a blank check. How much do you want? What is it going to take to get you to come play for us? And it worked. <clears throat> Your early thoughts on this move and, and what this means for the Yankees now. Are they the team to beat in Major League Baseball? Uh, I think they're one of the teams to beat. Uh, they they obviously now have a stacked rotation. They already had a pretty solid one. Right. Uh, but you could say that the, the main thing with the Yankees, their main issue was their starting rotation. Uh, going back to last year's playoffs and the playoffs before, because Luis Severino uh, hadn't lived up to his moniker as an ace and number one in the playoffs. Tanaka was great, but he was always kind of on and off... Um, the injured list, mm-hmm. uh, and the other guys were kind of sub, you know supplemental players that you, you wouldn't you're not supposed to rely on in the playoffs. Now they grab Garrett Cole, who's a bona fide you know stud pitcher. He is potentially the best pitcher in Major League Baseball, arguably the one of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball. And uh, and you and the Yankees now have an ace, and that's scary for the rest of the league because the Yankees already were good. Uh, they, they already have a great lineup, one of the best in baseball. They already have a great bullpen, uh, and, uh, and now they have a great starting rotation. It's just nothing but good for the Yankees, and they don't care about spending money, so it's just... Yeah, apparently going over yeah. the luxury tax and paying the luxury yeah. tax is not a big deal when you are the Yankees. And if it means winning championships, which is their ultimate goal, they haven't won since 2009. Yeah. They've been close, right? But they haven't won since 2009. Uh, it, it will be well worth it, and, and the Steinbrenners will gladly pay out that luxury tax and all that extra money if it means winning. Yeah, no, and that's exactly what they did here. And so now we, uh, you know, the Yankees are stacked, and the AL has, uh, you know, a team to beat in, 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 the, in baseball. The Astros, you know, they, 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 they go to the World Series last year, they, but they now lose Garrett Cole. There's rumors that Carlos Correa is going to have to get traded because of salary cap issues and stuff like that. So they're going to be decreased a little bit. The Red Sox are thinking about selling like everybody right now because they can't afford anybody. Uh, and uh, and the, rest, the rest of the league is kind of just, you know, at a stalemate. So, yeah, the Yankees are the top team in the AL right now. They already arguably were, and now you add the best pitcher in baseball. Uh, but let's talk about... What you know? What happens here? Because they, it's this is a nine-year, three hundred and twenty-four million dollar deal. It breaks the record for the largest contract in history, uh, it, it, at least for a pitcher. I think Trout's might be a bit more, but I'm not one hundred percent on that. I think it at least ties it uh, for at least per year, millions of dollars, stuff like that. But nine years, three hundred twenty-four million, an opt-out after five, so he could leave one hundred and forty-five million dollars. On the table, if he wants to leave after five years, if the Yankees screw, screw things up, uh, but the, you know, essentially for the next five years, the Yankees have one of the best pitchers in baseball, and the Angels and Dodgers do not. And and throughout yesterday and um, and Monday, there was three teams that everybody was talking about. It was the Yankees, it was the Dodgers, and the Angels, and all equally, it seemed like had a chance 
And now what it came out to be was that uh, the Yankees just kind of oversold everybody. Which and they, the most they typically the do. And added an extra year that a lot of teams said they were not going to do. That's that ninth year. So They, they flexed their power. Right? They, they went like this. They said, yeah. we got bigger guns than you guys do out in California. And, and you're no match. And clearly, they were no match. No, and, and for my Dodgers, it was... I mean, for me, I, I, I did think that, that the Dodgers would go after Garrett Cole, but it wasn't like, oh, if we don't get Garrett, Garrett Cole, the seed next year is over. No, the Dodgers already have an ace in the waiting in Walker Buehler. They still have Clayton Kershaw, who's awesome during the regular season. And they likely will add another pitcher or bring back Hanjin Ryu. So it, for me, it's not that big of a deal. Now I think they can go after somebody like Anthony Rendon. They can go after maybe some bullpen pieces and stuff like that. But I, for the Dodgers, I'm not too angry at this, and that's why I'm flexing the hat today. But for the Angels, this has me feeling very, very bad for the Angels because I think they really needed an ace. They had the worst... Oh, don't think. There was no thinking. Well, they needed an ace. And it, they were the worst pitching team in baseball last year. They had the worst ERA in all of Major League Baseball. I know there's injuries. I know they didn't have Otani. But still, to be 30th... It means you're in last place. And so if you could have gone from 30th to getting the best pitcher, that does help. Or Steven Strasburg, who we, we you know, we should probably talk about him at least. He went signed back with the Nationals. I, I, I did not expect him to leave, but nonetheless, the Angels don't get either of those guys now. Uh, both local guys in some ways in, in, for Southern California. And so now, Jared, what do they do? What, what do, do they have to do? They go after a couple veteran pitchers. Do they go look for a trade? Do they kind of just go, hey, whatever, we'll just draft a guy. We'll worry about next year. What do the Angels do? You know, I, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of faith because the Angels have been in this exact position for the last few years. Now there hasn't been a Garrett Cole type as a prize free agent the last few years. But this is we're, we're kind of pounding your head right against the wall. Yeah. The Angels, for years and years, have consistently needed pitching, right? Yeah, they're, they're, it, it's always nice to get a nice bat or a good third baseman at, in Rendon who's available. But at the end of the day, when you're consistently giving up five to six runs a game, you cannot count on Mike Trout being the only guy to produce or you know, having to score six or seven runs a game just to win, right? Defense wins championships, and last time I checked, the Angels have not been able to do that. So... What do you do? Do you go out and look for Bumgarner, who is probably one of the next prized free agents out there? Um, you do have Shohei Otani, who's going to come back and pitch next year, which is a great start. But I'm currently looking at their rotation. Uh, they did trade for Dylan Bundy from Baltimore, who I think he could be a good solid piece. Uh, uh, at, at best, a two, more than likely a, a three. He's a good piece if you right. have a Garrett Cole. Right, he's a great rotational piece. But right now, you have Andrew Heaney, Griffith Canning, um, Patrick Sandoval, none of those guys who I have any type of faith in, no. uh, or you know that I can that you can rely on and say this guy has experience. You know what you're going to get out of him. He can be a solid piece to build around. The, the Angels just do not have that, and maybe that was one of the reasons why Garrett Cole decided not to come to the Angels because he looked at those rosters and said. Uh, comparing the Angels and the Yankees yeah. is that, well, the Yankees are better suited to win in the near future, to whereas the Angels, it might take them three, four, five years just to build a team to become competitive. And so I think that played a huge factor as well. Like we mentioned, even though Garrett Cole uh, is from right here in our backyard in Newport Beach. And so for the Angels, you know, how do you bring those players in? Because it's tough to sell when you don't have a whole, obviously you have Mike Trout, arguably the best player in baseball. But other than Mike Trout, who do you have, right? You, you bring in a new whole management team, but it's 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 Joe Madden and Mike Trout right now. Those would be two selling points that you can uh, basically give to a player, and I, so far at least that hasn't been enough. No, so not. I don't I don't know what it is that the Angels have to do. Joe Madden has to sprinkle some fairy dust. He's he's got to pray to the gods. I don't know what he has to do to to bring in a prize free agent. Um, the the seat you know the off season is not lost. They can still build and bring in solid pieces, but to not get Garrett Cole when he's in your backyard, I, I think is a big loss. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's like I was saying, it's a bigger hit to the Angels uh, just because they need him. Uh, the Dodgers don't need Garrett Cole. It would have put them as, you know, it would have gave them another chance at the World Series, another legitimate chance. 
you know, to go head to head with all these AL teams and, and these NL teams that haven't done much either in the, uh, in the off season so far. And it would have gave them the edge up just like it did the Dodgers. But like you're saying, the Angels, you have a selling point of Mike Trout, who's obviously unbelievable, future Hall of Famer. And Joe Madden and, and Mickey Calloway, who comes from the Mets as the pitching coach as well. Uh, and obviously we know how good the Mets pitching staff uh, was. And, but, but like you're saying, you can't really rely on Shohei Otani because we still don't know if he's a pitcher or hitter yet. And he's probably not going to be able to do both his whole career. So you're going to lose out on one of those. Right. There's, just, there's always a but. There's <laughs> yeah. always a, you know, and, and you can say that with most teams. But with the Angels, when they have been so mediocre for, for so many years, yeah. right? I, I mean, literally. They had one, I mean, essentially since, I mean, I'm trying, since 2012, maybe, it was that one anomaly year and they've been average to below average every single year and they've had Mike Trout every single year. It, it just, they're, they're, it this, so that's one of the toughest parts of this yeah. is Mike Trout's prime years in the league are essentially being wasted. Now, he's a very loyal person, loyal player to the Angels organization. Obviously, when he signed his mega contract last year to basically secure his future with the Angels, he proved that. But the fact that the Angels have not gone out and, and done their due diligence in saying, okay, we need to now build around Mike Trout, not only with, with more hitting and defense, but with pitching, right? Yeah. I, I, if you're Mike Trout, I think you have to walk in to that manager's office and to the, the owner's office and say, hey, what are you guys doing, right? Like, I, okay, I get it. We didn't get Garrett Cole. Uh, you know, they were short on money and, and they didn't compare with what the Yankees were offering. But Bumgarner's out there. there. There are still reliable options and feasible options out there that the Angels have to now go out and get, right? It's, you're right. The Dodgers are set up to where they don't, they didn't need Garrett Cole, right? Yeah. They don't have to go out and get Bumgarner. They are more of an all-around team. The Angels have to go out and get one of these next top tier guys. Because if they don't, they're going to have the same exact season uh, this upcoming year, regardless of what Mike Trout does, regardless of how good of a manager Joe Madden is, it's not going to matter. At the end of the day, you have to have talent at certain positions. And the fact that the Angels do not have an ace is going to be their Achilles heel uh, until they find And they haven't had an ace for a very, very long time. So that this is why we're complaining here because they don't, you know, and even if they get an ace per se, it's going to be somebody that's a bit over the hill. You know, there's been rumors of a David Price trade, uh, but David Price is not in his prime anymore and has had a lot of issues in the playoffs before. Madison Bumgarner is not in his prime anymore. Obviously, he has the playoff pedigree, but you have to get there in order to use Madison Bumgarner at his best, right. and the Angels don't get to the playoffs. Ask Mike Trapp. <laughs> so... You know, there's a, it, you can go get Dallas Keuchel. I, the, again, another guy that's over the hill. That's it, a name. It, it's that's just, a name. He looks great on paper. I, can they, can they produce I, I, I'm for trying a full to, I, season? I'm, I'm going to bring up here some uh, some free agents for next year that they potentially could trade for. Uh, it's, not see, looking, see, it's not looking Here's good. the thing. Here's the thing with that. Yeah. You want to now start, talk, start talking about trading players. You are now uh, depleting your farm system, right? When, when the Which Angels they've done over and over and over again. Have, Continue. By not yeah. ever getting Basically, better. what we are saying, people, is that the Angels, ha, you know, they needed to strike gold and they did not do that. They don't have a whole lot of wiggle room to miss out on these top tier free agents because of the way that their entire team is set up. Now, uh, you know, maybe this is somewhat of a rebuilding and, and Mike Trout, you know, signed off on that and said, okay, I will sign with you guys long term if it will take a couple years. But as a fan and seeing that this team has been so mediocre for over a decade, it is tough to sit here and year after year see this team continue to struggle when it is obvious of what they need. Yeah. Now, I do want to get back to Garrett Cole's contract really quickly because I think there's some interesting points to it. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned the nine years, right? And uh, it was originally going to be an eight year, eight year deal. They added that one year. There is the, the you know, opt out by Cole after the fifth year. Why do you feel, do you feel that some teams weren't interested because that it was too lengthy. Like I've already read a couple reports that said that while Garrett Cole is great and he deserved all the money in the world, the fact that it's a nine year deal, does that like, do you think that in the end that can hurt the Yankees? Or do you think because there's that opt out clause that it's not really that big of a deal? Well, the opt out clause would be his own choice though. So, it, it, so it's a player option, it's a, not that's, a team That's what option. always happens. There's no way he even signs a contract and there's a team option. Okay. Because then, you know, if he gets hurt or whatever, then he's out of a job. 
right? Nobody wants to be out of a job based on circumstances. So Garrett Cole will have the choice in five years whether he wants to come back to the Yankees uh, or not. And at that point, so right now he is 29 years old. He won't turn 30 until September of uh, this next year. So he's going to be 29 for pretty much the whole season next year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they have him locked up till he's 37, 38 years old. If he plays the entirety. He plays the entire season. deal. He could be a free agent when he's 34. Again, that might be a little bit sketchy, but if he really, you know, if he's really still pitching well, you might want to get, you know, that one more contract. I can't imagine you making be, you uh, making more than $36 million a year unless this turns into the NBA and people start making 50. Uh, never know. Yeah, you, and, and exactly. You never and it know. will happen eventually. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, it's interesting. This could, this reminds me of, and a lot of people, the CC Sabathia deal. And obviously, CC Sabathia, he won him a World Series, but you know, after that, CC was definitely not worth his contract at the time. When you look at how much he was actually getting paid, you know, it, it's not that much in today's MLB money. But at the time, he did not play up to his contract. So you will just hope. That a guy like Garrett Cole is better. I think there's a, there's a lot of differences. Garrett Cole keeps himself in shape more than CC Sabathia did, True. which is a big thing. CC Sabathia took him a while to kind of understand that he wasn't a power pitcher for a while uh, until uh, about the last two years. So there are differences. I think Cole is a better pitcher than CC Sabathia uh, was at the time as well. So if you're a Yankee fan, you're good. This guy, you have him for nine years. If he ends up not being the best in the last four years, you hope that he wins a two or three World Series in the time that he at least is in his prime. That's at least what I take on the on the whole deal. Yeah, uh, I, I I saw some some little fun facts before we move on uh, because we do have to change segments pretty soon. Uh, for every strikeout that Garrett Cole gets, this is good. This is good. Hundred thousand dollars. I'm hundred and ten. I'm sorry, hundred and ten. Every pitch, nine thousand dollars. Nine thousand dollars wow. a pitch, pretty ridiculous, right? That's insane. Yeah, yeah. And it's so little, and there was a whole lot more, and we can get into it. And I don't want to, but I just thought those two were the most astounding. Nine thousand dollars per pitch, regardless of if it's, if it's a strike or a ball, whether it's a, a ground ball for an out or a home run. There's nine thousand dollars, and every strikeout is uh, one hundred thousand dollars. Every walk, thirty-six thousand dollars at least. Wow, wow, Everyone. unreal. <laughs> yeah, Garrett Cole getting paid. Yeah, no, no, it's uh, it's all, it's all. When you look at these contracts, it's insane. He also had no, uh, no trade costs. Yes, so, so the Yankees cannot trade him without his permission, in yeah. a sense, uh, but, which they are not going to do anyway because he is the top pitch in the league, and yeah, yeah he will be a Yankee until he's at least thirty-four. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, Garrett Cole signs with the Yankees. Uh, we'll see what happens as of right now while we're filming here live on Facebook. Nothing else has come down in the world of MLB as far as Madison Mumgarner, Anthony Rendon, um, and, and a multitude of other players that are kind of high-profile players right now on the free agent docket. So let's move on to the NFL. We will be on uh, kind of MLB winter meetings. Watch here. If something does go down during our podcast, we will talk about it and we will break into the NFL stuff. Uh, we, we, we're going to break this into segments. The NFL part, just in case... Anthony Rendon signs, uh, or there's a big trade or something in the MLB because we just want we don't want to miss out on that and then have to talk about it a week later. So once again, we had another great slate of games. Uh, I mean, every single time period on Sunday had a a real Marky big matchup. time exactly. So it was really fun to watch football um, on Sunday, and especially for me and you, who won my Cardinals suck, and there I didn't really want to watch their game, but I was forced to. Uh, and then your Cowboys played on, on Thursday. Hey, the Cowboys didn't lose on Sunday. No, they didn't. How about that? You're right. They yeah. technically did not lose on Sunday. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. happy about that. Yay. No, Yay. Cardinals improved their draft, their draft uh, stock. So, uh, yeah, no, but so, a lot of big games here. We want to start with the biggest and most entertaining, and that was the 49ers and Saints. Uh, great game, 48-46. Uh, 49ers come from behind in the last couple minutes to to win that ball game with a walk-off field goal. George Kittle uh, with a big play to get them down the field. Uh, and then 49ers improved to 11-2 and take sole possession of first place. So we want to kind of dive into, you know, what's going to happen here for the 49ers and the rest of the NFC West because, 
you have that interesting scenario of one of the teams potentially is the number one seed and one of the teams is going to be the fifth seed. And the fifth, the fifth seed is going to play the Cowboys or Eagles, which is a lot easier than any other team you can play in the playoffs. And the number one seed gets a bye. Uh, so, you know, the bye is a little bit more important here because you, you have the, um, the, the, the fact that you're not going to have to play that game. Even if you play the Eagles or Cowboys, you still have to play It would game. be on the road. Well, yeah, and it'd be on the road, but you still have to play a game. You risk injury. Guys don't get that extra week of, uh, of, of healing up and stuff like that. So you definitely want to get that bye. And right now the 49ers are 11-2, and they have that bye. In your opinion, are the 49ers as legit as their 11-2 record? Like, do, do you think they are the best team in the NFC? I do. I do. And listen, you know, the first seven, eight games of the year – uh, the 49ers had somewhat of a cakewalk, and there was a reason why they started so well. Obviously, they have talent on both sides of the ball. I think they're one of the most well-rounded teams in the NFL. Uh, but up until the last few weeks, they obviously went and, and beat the Saints in the Superdome, which is a very tough place to play. And the previous week, they traveled to Baltimore and lost by three points, right? They played Baltimore very, very tough. And they, they for the most part, shut down Lamar Jackson, which is, I don't think any other team in the league has done so far this year. So I think you have to give credit to this team because we were saying, okay, it's one thing to beat, you know, the, the average to below average teams, but how are you going to uh, play when you have to face a top tier opponent? And we've seen that the 49ers can take their game anywhere, anytime, any place. Defense travels everywhere. They have a solid running game. And Jimmy Garoppolo has played very well, I think, higher than expectations so far, right? He's been more of a game manager, and all he has to do is not turn the ball over, and he knows that he has playmakers all around the field, George Kittle uh, primarily, right? So this 49ers team, the one thing I will say, they have lost a couple key contributors contributors for the last, uh, or for the next few weeks, specifically Richard Sherman, who has a hamstring injury, he's gonna be out. So secondary is depleted a little bit, but uh, you know, I think that they have enough depth to where they can maintain this lead. And you know, here's the thing, like you mentioned, it's San Francisco and Seattle who are battling for that first place spot. And it's just kind of crazy to think about because you look at the NFC East and potentially the winner of that division will have a below 500 record. While you have Seattle and San Francisco who both have two, three losses. One of those teams is gonna end up first place, first round by, yeah. home field advantage, the other team that will have 10, 11, 12 wins is going to have a first round wild card road game against a potential below 500 team. It's, it's, it's completely ridiculous. And, and there's, you know, I think both of those teams are fighting tooth and nail to get that, that, that first place spot, right? Because yeah. like you mentioned, even though they will be going up against a lesser opponent, it's on the road. You don't get that extra week of rest and you always have that potential for injuries or whatever the case may be. So um, right now though, I would have to give it to the 49ers because of their depth. You look at Seattle and in my opinion, it's very simple. When Russell Wilson is on the field, Seattle always has a chance, which we've seen all year. You take Russell Wilson out of the equation, Seattle is a two to three win team this year and they are battling not for a playoff spot, but for the top spot in the 2020 NFL draft. That is how dramatic uh, of a swing Seattle can take, and that is, uh, that, that is how good Russell Wilson really is. So, yeah. you know, I, I think Seattle will maintain that first spot uh, in the division. They, they still have to play each other one more time, but, you know, the, the depth for, I'm sorry, San Francisco, the depth for San Francisco, I think, really comes into play. Yeah, it does come into play, but the one thing you do have to look at is Seattle did beat the 49ers. They do have one of the two losses. They, 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 they did give them the two losses, the other one being the Ravens. This season, and looking at these schedules, the 49ers, they played the Falcons this week. You got to win that kind of game if you're, if you're really going to be first place. That's a win. Yeah, uh, but then they play the Rams. And the Rams, the last two weeks, especially this last Sunday against a legitimate team in Seattle, look like they're kind of returning somewhat to that Super Bowl form that they had Played last year. Well. So, well. you know, that, that's not an easy matchup. I believe that is a Thursday night game. To No, uh, it's going to be one of the Saturday games, too. So a little bit of a short week as well uh, there. 
Uh, and then you look at Seattle's schedule. Seattle plays at the Panthers. Uh, Panthers are done. I mean, they, they just yeah, they fired by Vera. Stop Christian McCaffrey. They got murdered last game. week by Atlanta, and it's just not, you can tell, it's just not going. Cardinals are not playing well at all either. Uh, those are the next two games, and then, then they line up with the, the Week 17 matchup against 49ers. What I'm looking at here is, I expect these teams to be tied. I, and, and once again, that Week 17 game... Will be the, 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 the side for the division. The, the, exactly. So it, this isn't over yet either. Uh, and the other thing is, to your point about you said that the, the, the whole NFC East thing, like not only is the NFC East not, you know... Competitive. Not competitive, yeah. but Seattle and the Niners still have to play Week 17, and potentially the loser of that game has to play the next week. Too. Right. So that's... You're playing an extra playoff game, because that's a playoff game. You know what I'm saying? And maybe if the like if the if Seattle had the one game lead and and something like that, maybe you could rest Russell Wilson and stuff like that. Not them, but, but but that's not the way it's going to work. Seattle, the Niners cannot afford to lose that last game, so they are 100 percent going to have to try that last game. Because if Seattle beats them, even being the one loss down, it's 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 still it, it's Seattle would win the division. So. Man, it's the NFL is weird sometimes the, with the way I, I don't like the way season. it is. Yeah, it, it tires. I mean, here's the thing. I actually take back. I, I almost just guarantee to win for San Francisco when you mentioned their schedule against Atlanta. Yeah, I, I take that back. The Cowboys lost to the Jets this year. The the Eagles lost to the Dolphins this year. Uh, there there have been so many kind of crazy wacky upsets when when it should never ever happen. Yeah. So you know what. Atlanta, you never know. They, 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 you know. I mean, they played well. They, they lost Calvin Ridley, one of the top receivers, and we don't need to go into Atlanta. But I, you never know. That's why you play, right? And so I, I'm actually going to take my uh, prediction back, you know, <laughs> and, and not guarantee a win for San Francisco because after what we've seen so far this year, uh, you, you just never know. No, and Atlanta's kind of figured it out to end this season. Not that they have any chance to play playoffs, obviously, but they're 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 a way better team than they were at the beginning of the season. So that's not a cakewalk game. No, no. That is a solid matchup. Uh, Matt Ryan's figured it out. Julio Jones, you know, is doing his thing, and that defense has been playing a lot better too. So, but the, you know, to my point, you know, they have a they have a, a solid Falcons matchup, a tough Rams matchup. Uh, both are at home, uh, and then obviously you go into that Seattle game, no matter what, having to win that game. So this is not over for the 49ers, but. I I agree with you on one thing, and I, I'm surprised I haven't brought this point up. I do believe the 49ers are the better team. I don't necessarily agree with you that Seattle would be a 2-3 win team without Russell Wilson. I think they have a lot of talent on defense. I think they'd be able to win games. Uh, but besides that point, Seattle, you know, it's a lot. it reminds me a lot of the Chargers last year where the record is really good, but the team is not that good. And I think Seattle's more of a 10-6, 11-5 team this year that's massing itself as a 13-3 team uh, here or a 12-4 team. And I just think when we come to the playoffs, not necessarily the first round, but the second round, it's I'm not going to be guaranteeing Seattle wins against any of these teams based on their record. Uh, I, I do think that any matchup they go into in that second round of the playoffs is more than likely they're going to be they should be the underdog. In the Here was the, the scary thing yeah. from the game uh, when Seattle just played against the Rams. Yeah. The Rams defensive line completely obliterated. The Seattle offensive line, yeah. right? Their offensive line should There's be no ashamed rushing, themselves. No they game. should give back their paychecks for how poorly they played. Russell Wilson obviously didn't have a great game. That was because he had zero time and zero protection against the Rams defensive front. Now, obviously they have Aaron Donald, Clay Matthews, and a handful of good pass rushers, Dante Fowler Jr. But literally the Seattle offensive line, it's like they didn't show up. It's like they forgot that they had a night game against a, a division rival, a division opponent, right? When you are fighting for the number one seed in your division. So I think the most alarming thing for Seattle is figuring out their offensive line and how to keep Russell Wilson upright. Obviously, he can scramble and create plays out of nothing, but you don't want to have to rely on that on every single series. And literally, that's what was happening to Russell Wilson. He was scrambling for his life, and especially in the second half, that line just got worn down. So once again, I think it comes to the lack of depth for Seattle, and that's why I'm going to give the, 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 the vision to the 49ers, and I think Seattle will end up being that wild card, and they're going to have to go on the road uh, you know, with a potential 13-3 and or 12-4 and record. Just, just ridiculous. Yeah, and, and twice.
too, because you'd play the uh, you'd play the Cowboys or Eagles in the first round, and then you'd have to go to Green Bay or New Orleans. Wow. Uh, actually, they would probably play the 49ers, because if I think the other thing is I'm sure right? they would yeah. love that. Yeah, that would be it. So let's... Third time. Wow, third time. Wow. I like that. That doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a whole yeah. lot. Uh, let, let's talk about the Rams for a minute, right? Gonna, yeah, Same finish. division. Um, the Rams are sitting at 8-5 and five right now, and like you mentioned, uh, three weeks ago, they get blown out on Monday Night Football on national television by the the Ravens, who I think we can agree are probably the best team in the league right now, yeah. right? But they got they got embarrassed. No, like literally, home. like one of the worst performances I've seen. And Baltimore beat Miami fifty nine. Right, that's true. And Miami put up a better effort. Than got the embarrassed, team. right? You have to give them credit though. The last two weeks, like you mentioned, they went into Arizona and whooped on the Cardinals. And then this past week against Seattle came out and had a dominant performance. So they seem to have kind of, you know, weathered that storm against the Ravens and they're trending in the right direction. Now they're sitting at eight and five. Um, they're currently one game out of the wild card spot, right? Uh, you, have, you have Seattle and Minnesota that are currently in right now. Yeah. What are the Rams? Obviously, the Rams have to continue to win. Does this Rams team, do you have confidence that if they make it into the playoffs, they can actually go far? Or is this just a, you know, hey, we, we kind of found our spark towards the end of the year, but it might be a little too late for this team? No, I think it might be a little too late. And, and it's, uh, you, you look at you look at it, what, what they've done, they're one game back. Uh, Minnesota, you know, they have two very winnable games to end the season. Uh, they do have a matchup against the Packers, which is huge and actually potentially could be uh, for the division as well. Uh, but what the Rams need to do is have the Vikings at least lose one game. I, I'm trying to, I was trying to look it up before you brought up what the um, who would win a tiebreaker between the two because I don't think they played each other this year. Uh, yeah, they didn't. So it, it's it would be against the you know uh, against your conference record. And I would almost think the Vikings have a better record against the conference just because we've seen the Rams lose a lot of huge games this season. Um, yeah, see, the thing is, the Rams have, just, to, it, it might the Rams have yeah. to almost play perfect football the rest of the way with a little bit of help. And when you're getting late in the season like this and you're asking for help from other teams, that's never really a recipe for success. Now, you can get lucky and things can happen, but because the Rams didn't take care of business earlier on in the year, and you can say that was due to injuries, Clay Matthews was out for a month with a broken jaw. Uh, up until the last few weeks, Todd Gurley just has looked like a shell of himself. The Rams have finally started to give him the ball a little more, but for whatever reason, the Rams just, they, they didn't put it, put it together at the beginning of the year, and now they're having to somewhat scramble and uh, you know hope for the best with some other teams falling off, which right now, I don't really see Minnesota or Seattle completely falling off Definitely. and losing yeah. two of their last three games of the year, which would almost be the only way that the, uh, the Rams would get no. elevated. And, and the Rams running. have to go undefeated. Okay, they, they have to go into Dallas this week in a game where Dallas absolutely, I mean, how many times are they going to lose in a row, right? Like, they got to play better against the Rams, right? Like, it's just, it, that's just what I need. You, you would think, you yeah. would think, but yeah. we won't get into that. Yeah. Yet. Uh, and then they play the 49ers, and like, we're, you, you know, the 49ers are beatable. The Seattle has beat them, the Ravens have beat them, and the Rams, if they play like they did against Seattle, will beat the 49ers. I'll just say that, you know, right here. And then they finish the season against the Cardinals in LA. So, you know, they, they, they can win the next three games, but it's not an easy task. And then when you look at Minnesota, you, you know, if you're the Rams, you have to hope they lose two games, right? They're at Chargers, which is not a road game, and the Chargers have not been good this season. Uh, they play the Packers. That's tough. That's very losable. And they finish the season against the Bears. You know, the Bears are somewhat still in this playoff race, too. Uh, but they're not they, mathematically eliminated. They're not mathematically eliminated because they beat Minnesota earlier this year. So the, technically, if they tied Minnesota, they would have the tiebreaker and they would get in the playoffs. That's it. So... That game could mean a lot at the end of the season if the Bears go undefeated. Wishful thinking. Exactly. It's wishful thinking for both the Rams and the Bears uh, because it, it just it might be too late. And, and the losses against Tampa Bay earlier this season and, and, and losses to Seattle, and there was one more game I wanted to bring up that they lost to, is that, you know, at the Steelers too. Those, those are the killers right there because they're winnable games. Seattle not as much, but the game against Tampa Bay where they gave up 55 points and scored 40, 
can't do that. Uh, and then losing to the the Steelers as well is what you know. So I think I think we can both agree that while the Rams, you know, seem to be trending, I don't think the Rams trending in the right direction in the last few weeks of the season to end the year. Uh, unfortunately, because of how they started the year, you know, they're going to have to have a lot of help, and we just don't see other teams falling off enough to elevate the Rams into the playoffs. So unfortunately, there will more than likely, in our opinion, be two teams out of the NFC West, the 49ers and Seattle, representing that division in the playoffs. And no LA playoff games either, which is a little bit disappointing, because you always like to have those big games in Los Angeles, you always feel it in the city a little bit. Right. But, um, here's one thing that will be interesting, and, and your Rams fans can gripe as much as you want, because... If this was uh, if this was any other league that made sense, the Rams would be the sixth seed right now. And having playing the Cowboys, and if they destroy the Cowboys, for example, there's gonna be a lot of Rams fans saying we need to change the format of the playoffs because we're three games ahead of this happen. team Not and we whoop their ass. And so you get so you know the Rams realistically are actually a playoff team, but because of the way the NFL is structured, they're not. So if you're a Rams fan. Maybe just take it on the chin and just be like, we should have made the playoffs, whatever, but we probably... I'll, I'll say this too, real quick, because we need a transition. Uh, I do believe... I don't believe the Rams would win the Super Bowl this year. Even no, if they, I, they're, they're, they're so not. If you're a Rams fan, you got to be realistic. The offensive line isn't good. The defense isn't as good as it was last year. The offense can be, uh, when you have Cooper Cup, uh, Robert Woods, and Todd Gurley all kind of flowing. That offense is awesome, like it was on Sunday and like it was uh, against the Cardinals. And they have Brandon Cooks, who has literally been non-existent now. He's had yeah. some concussion problems and, and missed a few games. Yeah, so they've been but, up. But, yeah. I mean, literally, where has Brandon Cooks been all year long, right? Yeah, you, you have that three-headed monster at receiver plus Todd Gurley, right? But the fact that you haven't been able to get Cooks involved, the offensive line has not been good, and for some reason they just haven't utilized Todd Gurley uh, in the way that he should for especially how they, they gave him a huge contract last year. So I think a multitude of issues for this Rams team. They've got all the talent in the world. You look at them on paper and you're like, oh my gosh, this would be a playoff team and a Super Bowl contender. And they just haven't put it together this year for a multitude of reasons. Yeah, no, they have not. So we, we, uh, we'll, we'll move off the NFC now. We'll move to the AFC where we're going to talk about the Ravens. And uh, before the show, uh, we were talking about topics to bring up, and we disagreed on this one, so we wanted to bring it to the, the podcast. This is a debate show. Yes. Uh, Lamar Jackson is dealing with a quad issue, and Jared brought the point that maybe you sit him against the Jets tomorrow or today, whenever you're watching this, uh, on Thursday Night Football. Um, I disagree with you on that, because I think the Ravens need to get number one seed, because having... Home games throughout the playoffs until the Super Bowl is a big thing. And for teams, uh, when you have teams like the Patriots out there and the Chiefs with major home field advantages and, uh, and, and just as good as rosters, you know, in many ways, I just think you need that number one seed and you, you can rest Lamar Jackson when you have the number one seed locked up in Week 17 rather than right now. What is your thinking behind sitting Lamar Jackson potentially against the Jets, who are playing better football this season. So, so it, my thing is all about health and, and being at your best going into the playoffs. So it's a short week, right? Ravens uh, were on the road in Buffalo, and now they're playing on a short week when they are uh, home against the Jets. But either way, instead of getting six, seven days to prepare, you are now getting three days to prepare. Quad injury for Lamar Jackson. We all know that he uses his legs more than any other quarterback in the league yep. to create and make ever, plays. Actually, ever. So even though he can probably still go out and play, the thing is you are risking further injury against a team that is very beatable without your superstar, right? The Jets, any, you should be able to beat the Jets without having to use trickery, without your star players having to play at their best. And I'm sorry, that's, that's not meant to be a knock on the Jets. They are just not a good football team. Yeah. So my thinking is, yes, obviously it would be great to have that first round by the number one overall seed in the AFC and have home field advantage throughout the playoffs. But this Ravens team, just like I mentioned with the 49ers, they are set up to where they play great defense. They run the ball better than almost any team in the league. And those two, I, those two instances, I think they travel anywhere, anytime. The Ravens can play in sleet, snow, rain, in a dome, at home, on the road. It does not matter. The Ravens will play well, and their system travels anywhere. So for those reasons, I don't think it's a necessity that the Ravens have to have the number one spot because I think they can travel to New England, to Kansas City, play any of those teams, and, and, and win, right? So... 
I think if Lamar Jackson is seriously nursing that quad, depending on how he feels, now he already came out yesterday on Tuesday and said that he is going to play. But if your head coach, Jim Harbaugh, if you're in that front office, you have to protect your superstar. Of course, they're going to want to play. They're, they, they're, they're, they're uh, competitors. They want to get out there and play, right? Uh, but if, if he is, you know, around teetering around 80%, I'm saying you're either not playing or you are going to sit back and be a thrower and you are not going to run the ball because you cannot risk an injury against the New York Jets. If this were week 16, week 17 against a division opponent and you had to get into the playoffs, I completely understand it. But a short week on a Thursday against a weak opponent and if Lamar Jackson goes out and gets injured, oh my gosh, can you imagine <laughs> The heat that head coach Jim Harbaugh, I'll have heat on John Harbaugh, sorry, John Harbaugh, I said Jim Harbaugh, that John Harbaugh will be getting. So that, that, that's what you're risking. Here's the thing. You're yeah. risking all that to get a number one seed when you are clearly the best team in the NFL. He, well, no, and I, I agree with you. They, they, are, uh, they are the best team in the NFL right now. But, and their schedule isn't actually difficult to end the season. No, the Jets, but let's the just Browns, say, let's the okay, Steelers. I don't trust Robert Griffin third at all. Okay, so I actually, I, you know, you look at a Jets, uh, a Jets Ravens matchup with Robert Griffin third. Jets have a chance. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm giving them a chance. Okay. That, that, that's why I just, if the Ravens go to the eleven and three, um, and then they potentially lose another game after that, you're risking getting um, a third seed as well, potentially too. So it's just like, I don't know. I, I, I say you play the game this week. You do more of a passing attack. Uh, you don't run as much with Lamar Jackson. If you're saying they're as bad as you think they, you're saying they are, then you should be able to not have to use your full playbook to beat them. And then you have extra rest. You play the Browns, you lock up number one seed, and you move on to the playoffs. And you take this, and then the Steelers can just win that game to end the season and make the playoffs. Or you rest Lamar Jackson on Thursday night. You give him an extra. Like, he almost has, what, like two weeks to rest, weeks. Yeah, right? Weeks, so yeah. then you could say, okay, maybe if the quad, it just, it's just, it's a kind of nursing an injury, it's a strain or something like that. Uh, you, you rest them this week. Here's the thing, if they were playing on Sunday, I think I would have a different opinion about this. No, the, the, sure. the biggest thing yeah. is the fact that they're playing on a short week, and I don't care if you are 100% healthy or if you're nursing an injury, it is tough to get up and play four days later after you just played a brutal game. And by the way, they played in Buffalo. Well, Buffalo's a tough team to play, right? So it's not like they, they had a cakewalk against a, a, a yeah, crappy team. That was the they game. just came off a very tough win in Buffalo. So it, this to me is more about the short week uh, as almost anything else. If they were playing on Sunday and Lamar Jackson had those extra days that whole weekend to kind of nurse that quad, I think I would have a different opinion. I'd probably agree with you. Yeah. But the short week, I'm just like, man, Rest the dude. Give him that full extra week to prepare to go play the Cleveland Browns. Um, you know, and, and by the way, the Ravens lost to the Browns earlier this year. I can guarantee you that they haven't forgot about that. And even though the Ravens are already locked into the playoffs, they're going to want to come out and beat the brakes off the Browns, right? So you think Lamar Jackson doesn't want to play in that game? I, I think you rest him for this Jets game and say, hey, we'll unleash you and get a little bit of revenge against a division opponent who, you know, you, who you lost to earlier in the year. So I, I don't think there's... there's I think we both make good arguments. I, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with you that he'll play against the Browns. He's going to play against the Jets, too. All right. I mean, Jay, all he's right. too much of a competitor. He's not right. gonna take I know off. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> the team needs though. to yeah. protect him from himself. <laughs> it, it, no, it's, you make a good point. And you, you, look at, uh, you look at Kansas City, who did beat the Ravens. They did. Year, and that's where, this, that's where this number one seed thing comes up. Because if they end up with the same record... Kansas City would get that spot. But I understand. I understand. understand. And, and Kansas City's schedule is not hard, and they don't want to be third seed, so they're going to try to, you know, they don't. They want to buy, and they already beat New England, so all they have to do is have New England lose one more game, and essentially they're, 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 they're it. So, you know, Kansas City will be competing, um, and there's a really good chance the Ravens will just end up with number one seed. I just say, don't test fate early in the season out of the squad. Play the game against Jets. Take the 10 days off, play against the Browns, get your revenge, kick their ass, and then take the Pittsburgh game off. You have two weeks then again. That's where he takes the two weeks off. Not right now. I think you just need to lock up the division. You're right. too much of a competitor. You need to show the league that did some little quad injury 
and can affect some little quad injury. I'm telling you, Jay, Lamar, if he Lamar gets, Jackson gets injured this hurt, game. Oh, you can, you can. I, the, we, I will admit I was wrong. I, if he gets hurt, I'll admit I was wrong because I don't, I don't think he's going to get hurt because I think they're just going to run a game plan that's not as stringent on his legs. All right, and, you know, but so. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. It's a good old debate on the, uh, on the Cover 2 podcast there. Um, so I, we do, I think we do have some, yeah, we, do, we definitely have some time for one more segment. And there hasn't been any M- MLB news yet. So uh, what did you, what was that last segment you wanted, to, you wanted to bring up? Oh, you mean just about the Patriots and, you know, Spygate oh, yeah, 2.0. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Patriots once again <laughs> using uh, cameras to <laughs> illegally spy on another team. Does that sound familiar to you, Nick? It sounds like something that happens every two, three years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Do once again. Gate? Yes. Yeah, okay. A little bit. That happened that. like a couple years ago. And uh, didn't they spy on the Jets back in the day when like Rex Ryan and Mark Sanchez were? They did. They did. So now this year, who are they spying on, Jerry? Oh, oh. It wouldn't be the Ravens. Or the no, Chiefs, no, 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 no. who are one of the top teams maybe in the NFL. Maybe, the, maybe they're, they're the Bills, right? Not maybe even the division division division. Yeah. No, 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 no. It would be the Cincinnati Bengals hey. with yeah. one win so far yeah. throughout this entire season. Yeah. 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 Um, yes, the New England Patriots, who say the, uh, Bill Belichick has come out and said that he has nothing to do with this. Oh, of course. Nor does the organization, even though they paid independent contractors. Really? They don't know they paid those guys? Apparently not, man. Apparently the money just uh, blew off trees and somehow landed in these contractors' hands and they somehow went and uh, the, the story is the Patriots were doing their own independent uh, documentary series on themselves and it was titled Do Your Job, right? Which is obviously a phrase that head coach Bill Belichick has uh, cloned throughout his tenure with the Patriots. And this was, like I said, supposed to be a series about the, the you know, the uh, scouts and all the little uh, intricacies of what it takes to build a Super Bowl champion roster. Well, guess what? These cameramen, who once again were independent contractors, were not necessarily working for the New England Patriots, for eight minutes straight had their cameras fixed on the Cincinnati Bengals sideline where they could see every single hand signal and exactly what the Bengals are doing. And oh, guess what? The New England Patriots are playing the Bengals this upcoming week. Oh. Coincidence? I think so. Hey, okay, here's the thing. So you said the quote you said was that the, they, they said they didn't know they hired this camera crew to do this documentary. Bill Belichick says that, that New England do. Patriots have zero... Uh, not accountability, but they, they, they are not involved in this in any way, shape, or form. So who's involved? I don't know. Who, it's a mystery. Who's doing it's a mystery. this thing for the Patriots? It's a mystery. Like, I don't, who just does things like that for the Patriots? It doesn't make any sense. A quote from Bill Belichick. Okay, perfect. Patriots staff had no involvement with videotaping. No, upset. There he's, he's correct because it wasn't staff. It was, Did he say unequivocal? Because if he said unequivocal, he's hey, lying. He said Patriots staff he's had lying. no involvement, but that doesn't mean that the Patriots organization did not hire these people yeah. and slip them an extra hundred and say, hey, if you get a chance, move that camera to the left a little bit yeah. and let's see what those bangles are doing on the yeah, sidelines. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure, and this might be a controversial statement, but uh, I'm sure Robert Kraft said he didn't pay, uh, he, either the Patriots weren't involved in the uh, the whole massage problem either, of course. but then there was evidence that he was. Man, what so, is it with the Patriots and cameras? Man? I, it just, I, you know what I'm saying? I just don't believe a single word any of these people say on the New England Patriots. Yeah, and they do not just, deserve any benefit of the doubt yeah. because of Spygate and because of uh, their, their checkered past. This isn't like another organization, I, it doesn't matter, but just about every organization in the league has not had the checkered past that the Patriots have had. So if this was the Miami Dolphins, we would probably say, you know what, we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt, and, and they were probably right, and they probably, you know, the independent contractors probably just messed up. The fact that this is the Patriots, you just, you have zero room for error, yeah, yeah, yeah. and yet every couple of years, like Nick just mentioned, something comes up where it's some type of cameraman, or, you know what I mean, it's just... You, you literally have to walk on, uh, you're walking on thin ice right now, and, and you have to tiptoe around, and the Patriots just seem to not really care, right? They're, 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 they don't. they're treating everyone uh, uh, like, like we're stupid, like, like oh, we're, you know, we're not going to know, or it's not going to matter. At the end of the day, I'm sorry, but you, you have to 
after, after so many instances, when we look back in 20, 30 years at this dynasty that this Patriots team has built, it's almost as if you have to put somewhat of an asterisk next to it, right? Because they just attempt to cheat in so many different ways. Yeah. You can't take away the six Super Bowls, but Spygate and now this instance, it's like, why do you feel the need to push the envelope and quote unquote, and in a sense, cheat, right? Just to win. Well, I, I, there, there has yeah. to be a, a small asterisk next to this entire dynasty. The weird thing about this one is that they're spying on a team that's literally the worst team in the league. One win. And this the year. Patriots could not play Tom Brady. They'll still win. Like, they, they would still win. Rookie head coach yeah. benched Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton is now back in the starting lineup. Yeah. Uh, he's, been, he's been playing better, though. He's been, I mean, from what the hell he was doing earlier in the season, I mean. One win. Yeah. The New England Patriots, right? Leading their yeah. division, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, hey, Julian they Edelman. Win. They need a win. And they are spying on a team with the, one win. The, the Patriots have not looked good, which is probably. And you see, here's the other thing. If the Patriots were like one loss team right now, and they did this, maybe I'd be like, okay, it's probably BS, right? Would they really have to spot the Bengals? But hey, man, they have not looked good. Maybe for the last month. Wow, the and Patriots have so, three losses on their record. And they They're cheat. first in their division, but yet the sky is falling yeah. and the world's going to crash and, and come to an end because the Patriots aren't, you know, the, the, the crazy juggernaut that they usually are at this time of the year. Is that what we're saying right now? I, that, I mean, that's what it seems like. And you mentioned the asterisks too. You know, when they spy on the Jets, the Jets were a really good team. Uh, you know, when they, when they cheated against the Colts, it was kind of the determining factor in the Colts and the Patriots getting, to, you know, getting further in the playoffs that year. Yeah. And, and now this, they start to lose. You know, oh, they, poor Patriots. Yeah, well, the, 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 I have so it, much sympathy for them. I don't at all. It's been I'm, such just, a rough, I'm just trying to. I'm not just the Patriots. At all. I'm just explaining. I'm explaining what's happened. They had um, the game against the Ravens where they got blown out. They had then two poor matchups against the Cowboys and Eagles that they ended up winning, but they didn't look good in. And then they get uh, blown out by the Texans, and they lose to the Chiefs last week. Now they cheat. It makes sense. And they, I, I'm trying to actually prove that they're more guilty. I, I'm saying that because it of how bad sense. they play. Yeah, it's it, – because you know what they're probably thinking, Jared? They're thinking if we win this game against the Bengals, we pretty much lock up the division, right? And then we can just not worry about playing Tom Brady – and all that stuff, and you know the Dolphins game at the end of the season. Jared Salem can play, and all that stuff. I'm seeing for the Bills. You know what? You're so right. It makes sense. Listen, that they would go they, and cheat. Exactly. The, the, the Bills play the Steelers right this weekend. That could be a loss. If the Bills lose and the Patriots win, Patriots win the division. So it's, I, it, I, why wouldn't they cheat? They're like, might as well just win this game no matter what, right? Let's just like see the hand signals. Let's just beat the shit out of the Bengals. Let's embarrass them, and let's just put some fear into the Bills the next week that they play them. They cheated, for sure. We just, we just did it. We don't need no trial. We just figured out the whole thing. They died in the past when they needed to, and they did it again when they I, need to, even though they don't really need to. They can do, yeah, I, it would make more sense if they did it to Kansas City or Baltimore during the playoffs. Like, at least do it when it makes sense. Like Don't do it against the Bengals. It makes you look stupid. Right? You know, I can't wait for the Patriots dynasty to just crash <laughs> and burn. Yeah. Tom Brady to retire, Bill Belichick to retire, the Patriots go, I don't know, five, six, seven years of just mediocrity. Like Golden State. And I, I want them to become Golden State. Yeah. In the last place. And they just come yeah. crashing down. And then we don't really have to talk about the Patriots for like five or six years. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm so tired of it, man. It's one thing when they're winning. And, and you know what? They have a 10-3 record there in first place. Good for them. Um, it's not their fault that their division – for the last decade has been complete crap. The oh, Bills show, have yeah. finally come to some type of relevance. Uh, but I, I'm just, the, the Spygate, uh, the cameras, all of it, I am, I am so sick and tired of it. Like, line up, you have some of the best, at least on defense, they can go up against anyone, one of the best defenses in the league. Line up and play football. The fact that they need to continue to go out and, and spy on other teams to get hand signals and all That's this stupid. other stuff is uh, just utterly ridiculous. And I'm, I'm frankly, Tired of talking about the Patriots. I hope the Patriots get bounced out in the first round of the playoffs. <laughs> oh, that is so awesome. I, I, I don't care. I hope, they, I hope they get the Ravens, even though it, it, it's probably not going to happen because of the seedings. I hope they get the Ravens at some point. The Ravens just beat the brakes off them like they did earlier in the year.
Yeah. No, it was in the way the seeds would probably work. They wouldn't play the Ravens. Not in the first round. They could potentially play them if they if they advance. But uh, no, I just Patriots. I'm I'm done with them. I'm yeah. done. No, we're all done with the Patriots. I mean, I they don't. Uh, we definitely don't want to see them in the Super Bowl this year for sure. Uh, let's put the Chiefs and Ravens. Everybody likes the Chiefs and Ravens, so let's put them in the Super Bowl. Chiefs and Ravens. You know, maybe, maybe the Bills. Let's put the Bills in the playoffs, right? Like in the Super Bowl. Maybe the Bills can have a chance too. Saints Ravens yeah. Super Bowl. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be amazing. It'd be awesome. Uh, all right, that's it for the podcast today. Real quick before we finished, uh, we did want to. Uh, if you wondered why we didn't talk about the college football playoff, it's because we predicted exactly what was going to happen, and we were right. So I was more right. I actually predicted the exact. Final you did. Four. You did. You switched that with Ohio State. I told you that wasn't going to happen. I told you. Hey, no, uh, yeah. and Ohio State didn't put out the best performance against Wisconsin, so it, it was. You know. Hey, what about it? What, what, what did we say though? What did I say on last week's show? Jalen Hurts. Oh, I cannot wait. Jalen Hurts, transfer quarterback. Three of the four quarterbacks in the college football yeah. championship are transfers. I think that is huge moving forward for these or uh, these programs and these head coaches that are trying to juggle their rosters every year. Uh, you have uh, you have Jalen Hurts. You've got Justin Fields and uh, yeah, the, the, um, <laughs> Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow. Thank you very much. <laughs> Formerly of Ohio State, all three of those are transfers. Um, Trevor Lawrence is the only non-transfer playing for, for Clemson right now. So I think that's huge. But uh, like I mentioned, Jalen Hurts, you know, transfers out of Alabama, right? Everyone says, oh my gosh, where's he going to land? He goes to Oklahoma. And now Oklahoma is in the playoffs and Alabama sitting outside looking at, I bet you they wish they still had Jalen Hurts. Right I now. bet you they do for yeah. sure. And I bet you LSU uh, was hoping that Utah would be in because now they have a guy that knows how to play them. So that's... Like, if you're LSU, you're thinking, we're number one seed, we're dominated, of course, our matchup against the four seed is against a guy that knows how to beat, like, knows how to beat us. A, so two, two very yeah. good matchups. Oh, dude, the college football playoff, this might be the best one we've had since they did the college football playoff scenario. Yeah. Like, Oklahoma, LSU, although I, I got LSU all the way in that game, that's still very interesting because of the fact that Jalen Hurts has that familiarity. Lincoln Riley's one of the best coaches in college football. And then the Clemson Ohio State matchup is I mean that could be a national championship. You know what I'm saying? So it's Clemson's first, in my opinion, first real test this year. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see undefeated defending national champions. They deserve the right to be in, but we'll see how how good of a team they are now that they're actually facing a legitimate opponent. And uh, what many people thought would be the number one team in Ohio State. So both of those games will be played on December 28th, a little later on in this month. So a couple weeks to prepare. Yeah, we're not gonna uh, the, the, you know, the New Year's Bowls won't be as great because these games will be played before that. But I think uh, you know, the NCAA wanted to give uh, whoever makes it to the championship game a little extra time to prepare and uh, you know, more time to juice that up. So uh, both those games, December 28th. And in the coming weeks, we will uh, begin to break down both of those games and matchups and give you our winners that will advance to the actual national championship game. For sure. But for this podcast, we are done. There's no more MLB. Let me just do one more check, Jim. Let me do one more there check. There is no more To news. make we would sure have, we would have heard it already. that uh, yeah. Giannis is out versus the Pelicans. Yes, that is not baseball news. <laughs> so uh, for Jared Smith, I'm Nick Nina. This has been the Cover 2 Podcast. Thanks for watching. We will see you guys next week.